next hour is going to be a presentation by Dr. Michael Saunders. Michael is a clinical associate professor of medicine in the gastroenterology division. He's a GI doc. He's a, a specialist who studies illnesses of the gastrointestinal tract. He's the director of the Digestive Disease Center here at the University of Washington Medical Center. And he treats people that have all types of disorders of the intestinal tract, all the way from the esophagus, all the way down to the other end uh, at the anus. But mostly uh, gastroenterologists spend a lot of their time performing endoscopy, where they look into the gastrointestinal tract with these flexible fiber optic scopes to really not only see and diagnose the pathology, but also oftentimes treat them with GI bleeding, uh, ulcers, and things of that nature, which many of you have, we more senior members of the panel know we all had uncles and aunts and grandfathers and grandmothers who were afflicted with bleeding ulcers and things back in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. So Michael's a gastroenterologist, and he ta has taken that field one step beyond, which you'll see later. Um, he works with the world's smallest microscope developed by Selvisio to help detect cancers while they're actually still in the patient. And you'll see the demonstration of this microscope here in a few minutes. Michael's a, a local boy. He's a second generation UW gastroenterologist, in fact. His father, David, being a very distinguished teacher. And Michael has inherited not only that clinical practice not just inherited, it's not nepotism, but through his own very hard work. And he's also the director of the, the gastrointestinal course for the medical students, one of their most uh, popular uh, physiology courses in the second year. Michael didn't always want to be a physician. Like many physicians' children, they think, no, no, I'll do something different. But he went off to Western, received his degree here at Western Washington University, and I teased him about, did you go up there to study or to ski at Baker? And he kind of laughed and looked at his shoes. Uh, <laughs> he then went to Milwaukee, where he received his MD degree at, uh, at the Medical College of Wisconsin and studied with some of our UW graduates there, too, which are near and dear to my heart in the pediatric surgery division. He then came back to Seattle. We all know that's the best thing about being from Seattle is being able to come back. And he did his internal medicine residency here, as well as his gastroenterology fellowship. He's board certified in both internal medicine and in adult gastroenterology. And his research involves a variety of fields, but primarily studying the effectiveness of endoscopy in various different techniques, including this miniature microscopy to actually look at the cells, but also stent placement, or putting those little tubes like, we, like many cardiologists will expand uh, uh, coronary vessels in the heart to prevent uh, recurrent heart attacks, or in large vessels like the aorta, what we saw Dr. Starnes last year in the, uh, in the larger vessels of the body, and also mucosal resection and ablation of actually treating diseases in the GI tract through an endoscope with a variety of different technologies. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce a real fantastic clinician and wonderful guy, Dr. Michael Saunders. What I'd like to do is give you a little bit of a primer on gastroesophageal reflux disease and some of its complications, specifically what we call Barrett's esophagus and gastroesophageal uh, cancer. And then lead into where I think the field of gastroenterology is actually going, and that's not only just in diagnosis, um, but in therapy. And we've got some great new tools that we can use to uh, not only help detect early cancers, but now treat them endoscopically. 
and uh, of having the patient maybe avoid a more lengthy operation. And like any clinical case conference, I'd like to start with a real case that we saw. This is a 75-year-old gentleman who was referred to the university about a month ago with what's called high-grade dysplasia noted in a short segment of Barrett's esophagus on a recent endoscopy done for chronic GERD. Now, having said that sentence, I expect you at the end of this talk, if I've done a good job, you'll know exactly what that means. His GERD symptoms actually have been well controlled for many years on medications, and he was just undergoing a routine endoscopy, so he had no other symptoms. And his past history was notable as it would be for any 75-year-old male, some hypertension, coronary disease, and some prostate difficulties. Now, before we go on to the case and the rest of the talk, I want to give a little bit of a, a history of medicine. I always found the history of medicine in medical school part of the more interesting to uh, topics, no matter what disease you were looking at. But the endoscope, you know, gastroenterology actually wasn't always an end endoscopic field. In fact, my father, as Dr. Foy mentioned, went into gastroenterology in the early 60s. So it was a much more cerebral, I used to tease him, cerebral uh, field at that time. You could have scratched your chin and thought deeply about the patient. And they actually probably were much smarter than we are now because now gastroenterology is in large, in many ways, a glorified video game with these fancy scopes that we have. <laughs> such as this nice high-definition Olympus GIF H180. <laughs> this just feels good to hold this baby. <laughs> and it is amazing how it has transformed our field. And at the end, you can have, be able to come up and, and have a look at this. It really has transformed the way we not only look inside the GI tract, but uh, also treat and, and diagnose diseases. But a history is always important. So the first gastro camera, this was basically was a camera hooked onto a tube that was shoved down the stomach and took pictures, it was developed in 1950. It didn't really make it to mainstream uh, clinical medicine until the 70s. And the major breakthrough was not just putting a, a, a fiber optic endoscope, but it was putting a biopsy channel down. So for the first time in the mid to late 70s, clinicians could put a scope down and take a biopsy, N avoiding, before they'd have to do it with an open surgical procedure or you know, at, uh, at post-mortem. And it wasn't until the late 80s when our current video technology came. I remember as an uh, undergraduate, I would come and, and watch procedures with my dad, and, and they, this was in the days, again, with fiber optic, and they had the old teaching heads where they'd peer down. In fact, all gastroenterologists walked around like this, <laughs> and now I know why. They were looking at this old, now it's on the video screen, it's high definition, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So the word endoscopy is actually derived from the Greek, combining the word endo, meaning within, and the verb scoping, to view or observe. And that's very appropriate. So getting back to our case, we decided to do an endoscopy on this gentleman. And this is the scope here. And it's got a cap on. And you'll see the utility of this cap in a little bit. But here we're passing over the tongue. This is the tongue here. Epiglottis. And you just push gently with a little bit of air. Here's the, if I was to look up, you'd have your vocal cords up here, but I'm going posterior to look into the esophagus, and there, you slide. Very easy to do. The patient's with a little bit of sedation, doesn't remember a thing. A little bit of mucus. Uh, oh, sedation's a beautiful thing. I don't know what we could do without it. <laughs> a little Versed and fentanyl. So we're coming down the esophagus, and we're coming to the, the stomach esophageal junction. I know that by these tubes now, and I can also see down here into the stomach, but these, the tubes are the, the, tu the end of the tubular esophagus and the beginning of the gastric folds. And that's where the area in question for this case is. Right there, I s actually switched the light, the lighting of the endoscope. Not only do we have high definition bright light or white light, we can actually change the wavelength. And in this case, it, it's a blue wavelength called narrow band imaging which highlights the vascular, superficial vasculature, as I'll talk more about in a few minutes. So we're washing and suctioning here. And this is his stomach esophageal junction, with the stomach being the darker and the esophagus being the white. You can see this polypoid-looking look lesion here. It doesn't look like it should be long there. And most likely, that's where I, uh, we're, we're suspecting his possible early cancer is coming from. Now, we'll get back to him. Let's talk a little bit about gastroesophageal reflux disease as a, as a background. So reflux or GERD is very common, one of the more common GI disorders that we see. The prevalence is estimated to be about 18 to 19 million in this country, and it's rising for unclear reasons, um, much to do probably with our diet, and, and if you were to look at the obesity trends in this country, it would mirror the, the rise in, in reflux. 
just to give you a, a sense of what 19 million is compared to the population of New York City. So it's, it's, it's quite a lot. And it's th thought that, that in patients with established reflux or those with no reflux previous, that the symptoms increase by about 5% per year. So it's getting worse. And again, the reasons for that are not entirely clear. Now, like any disease, it's very important to understand why it happens. In fact, a, a really good patient will, that'll be the first question they ask me is, why do I have this? Or if you're, I tell my fellows and students that when a patient comes in with worsening reflux, they need to answer why. Why has it gotten worse? And it gets down to the mechanisms of disease. And starting from top down, start with the esophagus. So the esophagus main function is to transport food from the mouth to the stomach and keep it there. And if it doesn't keep it there, what's called defective esophageal clearance, you're much more likely to have prolonged contact with gastric contents and uh, damage from reflux. The lower esophageal sphincter, or LES, plays a critical role in the development of reflux for, uh, in a variety of ways. Probably the most common mechanism of reflux is what we call transient LES relaxations. And this is normally the LES is closed, except when we swallow. And then a peristaltic wave strips down the esophagus and opens the LES, and the bolus passes into the stomach. A transient LES relaxation is when that LES relaxes in the absence of a swallow. And the most common reason for it to do so is gastric distension, or the stomach being distended. And so you can see right off the bat that the main thing that's going to do that is a large meal. In fact, the, a transient LES relaxation is probably the body's way of venting yourself when you belch after a, a big meal after Thanksgiving and that belch felt so good, it's a transient LES relaxation that's occurring. But it's during those times that you get reflux. And so the transient LES relaxation is by far and away the most common reason for the garden variety reflux that you may get after a large meal. But it's also the main reason why you tell patients dietary wise, it's not that they need to avoid caffeine or alcohol or coffee, God forbid, or uh, chocolate. It's that you have to avoid eating all those at once is what we tend to do. <laughs> so smaller meals, low fat, Fat greatly slows stomach emptying and leads to more gastric distension. Now in some patients, the LES can actually be hypotensive or low pressure, and that's a problem. It doesn't act as a barrier even in, in, when it's not relaxing. And then finally, probably most importantly, for patients with severe reflexes, you have disruption of the, what we call the gastroesophageal junction. And most commonly, that's with a, what's, what's termed a hiatal hernia. And there's a lot of confusion, I think, in the population in regards to what, what's a hiatal hernia. And in general, it's where part of the stomach herniates up through the hole in the diaphragm to go into the chest cavity. And most are sliding, meaning they come and go. And they're very common. Maybe a third of the population has a hiatal hernia, if you were to look. So most of the time, they don't, they don't cause any problems. And when they do, though, it's they contribute to reflux. And in fact, it's the size of the hiatal hernia that determines the severity of one's reflux. So the larger the hernia, the, more, the worse the reflux. And then the stomach itself can cause problems. If it doesn't empty very well, you're more likely to get reflux back up into the esophagus or increase of intra-abdominal pressure. This is thought to be the mechanism with obesity, for instance, of why they may get so much reflux. Now, GERD can have complications. This hasn't always been thought. In fact, I remember as a child uh, watching the football games in the early 80s. I was going to say early 90s, but uh, uh, you guys would call BS on that. In the early 80s, um, you know, the ho-hum, take a, take a Rolaid spells relief type of commercial. Well, we now know that reflux is not a, a, a benign condition. It certainly can be associated with complications. And we divide these into esophageal or extraesophageal. The esophageal, as we'll go into, are the Barrett's esophagus and the cancer. You can also get strictures and ulceration and bleeding. Extraesophageal manifestations, uh, we look at the lung, where you can get asthma and recurrent pneumonias, or the larynx, where you can get recurrent or reflux laryngitis, even vocal cord ulcers and stenosis. Now, as I mentioned, uh, esophageal cancer is a complication of reflux. And what, one of the things that's gotten the medical community, at least the GI community, interested is this rise in the uh, incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma. More so than any other cancer, it's the rise in esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now, keep in mind that the absolute incidence is still pales in comparison to, say, lung or breast cancer or colon cancer. But colon cancer, for instance, that line is actually decreasing. We're doing a better job of screening, and the incidence of colon cancer is declining. But esophageal cancer is rising for uncertain reasons. And it may be that it, it parallels the obesity trends in this country, and, you're, and you're, you're getting more reflux. 
Now, Barrett's esophagus is an example of a, what we term a metaplasia, and that's a change from one cell type to another cell type. And in this case, it's a change in the squamous esophageal epithelium to a columnar or intestinal type epithelium. And this is confirmed, recognized on endoscopy and confirmed by biopsy. Now, the significance of Barrett's is that it can be, uh, it's thought to be the, the pre-malignant lesion in esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now, as I mentioned, this is something that we see on endoscopy. So in this case, for instance, the stomach esophageal junctions here, and here's the white squamous of the esophagus and the pink of the stomach, and you can see this pink-type mucosa is extending up the esophagus where it shouldn't be. And when you take biopsies, you see it, it's an intestinal light uh, type uh, epithelium with these dark blue uh, goblet cells that are staining with this special stain called alcium blue. But that's the, how we make the diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. Now it's interesting, getting back to the history of medicine, Barrett's esophagus is named actually a, after an Australian surgeon named Norman Barrett, who incorrectly described this back in 1950s, but his name stuck with it ever since. So sometimes it's lucky, it's, it's fortunate to be more lucky than good. Now, as I mentioned, Barrett's is thought to be the pre-malignant lesion in esophageal adenocarcinoma. The true prevalence of Barrett's, actually, we do not know in the general population. We do know that if I took 100 patients with chronic reflux and endoscoped them, I'd find it in about 5 to 10 percent. The reported incidence of, is rising, not surprisingly, much like reflux and adenocarcinoma. And the risk factors for it include the older we get, male sex, white race, chronic reflux symptoms, and obesity. And as I mentioned, the significance is that it does carry an increased risk of esophageal adeno adenocarcinoma, thought to be 30 times the patient without Barrett's esophagus. Now what's important to the patient, though, is what's my absolute risk? And this is a good example of the difference between that. So someone who has monthly heartburn has about a 1 in 10 million chance per year of going on to get esophageal adenocarcinoma. Someone with Barrett's esophagus, that's much higher but still, the percent per year is still 1 in 200. So it's less than half a percent per year. So most patients with Barrett's don't go on to get cancer. And, it, and some recent data suggests that Barrett's happens for a reason, that there may be some protective effect to it. And it's probably that it, if you think about it, the squamous epithelium of the esophagus is very poorly de uh, adept at dealing with acid injury. And yet the columnar type epithelium or intestinal type meta, um, epithelium from a, from what the stomach, similar to the stomach, is bathed in acid. It does very well protecting itself with, with mucin production and things like that. And it's not uncommon for you to see a patient with Barrett's esophagus with a very long segment and ask them, do they have reflux? And they say no. And you say, well, how can that be? You've got a long segment of Barrett's esophagus. And then they'll say, you know, I used to have reflux many years ago, but I haven't had to take a Tums for 20 years. And so there is some protective effect to the Barrett's. It is, is, is associated with a, an increased risk of, of going on to cancer. And like most cancers, it's a model, a biological model of what's thought to happen. So you have your healthy esophagus, you get squamous epithelial injury due to reflux, and that eventually, in about 5 to 10 percent of patients, leads to this specialized intestinal metaplasia, or Barrett's. And then in a small proportion, that progresses, whether that's with injury or not, we don't know, to what we call dysplasia. And dysplasia is a term for early cancerous changes. And in Barrett's esophagus, we ask our pathologist to grade that into none, indefinite, low grade, or high grade. So when we take biopsies of someone with Barrett's, we want that answer from the pathologist. Is there dysplasia there? Because what we found is that patients, only patients with high grade dysplasia end up having trouble. And that those with negative or even low grade don't tend to progress. And Having said that, though, even patients with high-grade dysplasia at five years, only about 50% go on to cancer. So it's not a guarantee that even with high-grade dysplasia, you're going to go on to cancer. So this is sort of the simplified algorithm of how we manage patients with Barrett's esophagus. We do do screening and surveillance for uh, patients with reflux for Barrett's esophagus in this country. I should point out that in many places in the world, including Canada and Europe, do not because they do not believe that it's cost-effective. We have the 31st, 35th, I guess, costliest healthcare in the, in the world for a reason. This is one of them, maybe. But we do endoscopies, and if they have no dysplasia, it's every three to five years. If there is dysplasia, again, we have the pathologist grade it for us. Low grade, we tend to just bring those patients on a six to 12 month basis. 
If it's high grade dysplasia, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. When I was a fellow, the board's answer for this question, if it was given to someone on a test, would have been they go to surgery and get their esophagus taken out. But that's changed, and I would say in 2010, the uh, answer for high-grade dysplasia is probably going to be endoscopic treatment for that patient. But a lot depends on, on how, what their physical fitness is and can they withstand a surgery if needed. Now, as I mentioned, we do surveillance endoscopies for patients with Barrett's, and that protocol is actually called the Seattle Protocol, developed here in the 1980s by Brian Reed, uh, Cy Rubin, and Doug Levine. And it, it, it entitled or it encompassed you doing four quadrant biopsies every one to two centimeters of the Barrett segment. And with that, you can actually be pretty good at looking for dysplasia or cancer, but you're not perfect. And, the, and there's been studies that have shown that the amount of tissue that you sample with, that's about 5% of the Barrett's tissue. So you're looking for, hoping for a field defect. It's a random biopsy. You're guessing a little bit when you do that. And what would be nice is to have better techniques to highlight or to show you where the, the early cancerous changes are. And what's become standard now, as I've mentioned earlier, is, is high definition white light standard endoscopy. Much like we have high definition TVs, we have high definition endoscopes with high definition monitors, the up to 1 million pixels per, of resolution. Really quite amazing compared to uh, where we came from uh, 15, 20 years ago. Narrow band imaging, I've already mentioned, that's using a blue light. Uh, which has a shorter wavelength, so it captures the very superficial mucosal uh, area, and that is where often where the blood vessels are. And, and neoplastic or, t or early cancerous areas have abnormal blood vessel patterns, and you can pick that up with this technique. And then what I'm going to go on and talk further about is something called confocal microscopy, which uses a laser to give you a very focal pinpoint area of, 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 uh, uh, of imaging down to the subcellular level. And for the first time, really, we have real-time Im imaging while we're doing a procedure uh, at the cellular, cellular level. Now, I'm not going to pretend, pretend to be a, a biophysicist or astrophysicist, because this is where the genesis of this uh, device actually was, was uh, from an astrophysicist. But it, it, the key to confocal laser endomicroscopy is it requires in-focus images at selective depths uh, point by point, and then those images are reflected back. The laser comes down onto the specimen. It's reflected back through a pinhole to a filter and then to a detector, which is a computer. And a software program then basically makes sense of the images you're looking at. The magnification is up to a thousand-fold. And w during this, though, we have to use some sort of contrast agent. And so we inject intravenous fluorescein which uh, is a relatively inert substance, and it will go to, all, uh, to the, well, fluoresce uh, and picked up by the laser. And so everything that's bright or white is vascular. Everything is dark is, is avascular or not taking up the fluorescein. So the confocal mini probes are the, are the key to the endoscopic application of this. And these are tiny, generally about a one to two millimeter uh, probes that are compatible through the accessory channel of most video endoscopes. Again, the resolution can be one to three and a half microns. We generally uh, view a field of about 20 microns. And it gives you real-time video sequences, about 12 images per second. So again, the probe generally is put on FOSS or perpendicular to the mucosa. So here's the histologic correlate here. You see these glands. This is the colon here. These nice, round, circular, normal glands. And here's the correlate with the confocal. Again, the, the dark's going to be where the the, the, there's, there's no blood vessels or there's, there's no fluorescein getting to it. So the bright's the, the fluorescein. You can see that it highlights nicely, though, the cellular structure. Now, the potential benefits of this, as I mentioned, are primarily early detection of, of cancers or precancerous lesions, which then we think will allow to earlier intervention uh, and, and reduce the need for subsequent uh, endoscopies or biopsies, if you can take care of the, the issue right then and, and there. And it ultimately is to improve clinical outcomes and patient care. Where is this being used? Well, in the gastrointestinal tract, we're using it in the, obviously in the esophagus with Barrett's. It's being used to look at colon polyps. Uh, there are a variety of types of colon polyps. We're only interested in one when we do colon screening. And we end up just taking every polyp out that we see. And that adds to cost and unnecessary procedures and things. And if you could use this technique to, to diagnose what type of polyp it was and leave alone the ones that aren't pre-malignant and take the ones that are, 
out, it would uh, greatly uh, simplify or, or probably reduce the cost of colonoscopy. The bile duct, we can actually put these up inside the bile duct and, and evaluate uh, strictures that are of uncertain uh, significance or concerning for cancer and some other inflammatory diseases. It's also being looked outside the gastrointestinal tract at the lung in the evaluation and detection of lung cancer. So now, with that background, we're going to make you all confocal experts. All right, this is a training session. So this is squamous epithelium. It's important to know what normal looks like. So here's the normal squamous. This is sort of the tangential view here. And these are, if you're looking on FOSS, you'd see these scale-like cells with some intra, what are called intracapillary loops. And on confocal, they look like a little white because it's fluorescein. The vascular will be white, bright uh, blood vessels. And so this is the, the video here, putting the probe on the, on the epithelium. You can see a nice fish scale epithelium here. These beautiful little uh, capillary loops, these bright loops. It's amazing. You're trying to stay as still as you can. And it's amazing still how much movement, just the respiratory movement of the patient. But you can see it down to, again to the individual cellular level. Now let's move down to Barrett's esophagus. So remember, Barrett's is a, a columnar or intestinal type epithelium. Here's the histology here. Usually dark mucin in the, in the goblet cells. Here's the Barrett's cor correlate on con confoc. And you can immediately see there's a big difference between that and squamous that you just saw. So you can easily pick this up real time while you're doing an endoscopy. Is there Barrett's there? Yes, you can see the, the columnar type epithelium here. Almost like the finger-like villus pattern you'd expect to see in the small intestine. And these Dark areas here are some of the, the, the goblet cells. Now, more importantly, so you see Barrett's, yes. Is there dysplasia? Again, that's the, the key word we're interested in. Is there evidence of early cancer? And as pathologists look for dysplasia, some of the keys they look for are a change in the organization of the cells. Generally, the cells become darker, disorganized. And you can see that here on the, on the confocal image. And very dark, very disorganized cells, very little glandular structure remaining. And that, so that would be very concerning and consistent with a dysplastic process. Now, we're not going to tell them whether this is cancer or low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia. We just want to know if it's dysplasia, because then we can target our therapy to that spot. So this is back to our case in, in, in question. Here we have a confocal probe down. This is the lesion that we want to look at. And so we'll put the probe on the lesion. And on a sub subsequent screen, this does require you to be able to, to look and chew gum at the same time, at different uh, monitors. But you can see the, these cells are much like that last picture, very dark. Although there's some organization of glands, there's the uniformity of the cells is not there. There are some that are big and some that are small. And, and uh, they're starting to lose that, that nice structure we see with, with, gen with usual type of intestinal epithelium. Well, that's all very good. But now the question is, what do we do with that? And in the old days, we'd just take a biopsy, and then we'd say, OK, you have probably an early cancer. We need to set you up to see a surgeon. And that's still not necessarily a, a wrong thing to do. But I think we can get more information now and potentially treat the patient at the same time. And this brings us to advances in endoscopic therapy. This is a technique called endoscopic mucosal resection, or EMR. And basically, it's a minimally invasive alternative, if you will, to surgical resection for early cancer. It's been used primarily, uh, actually the Japanese were the first to, to initiate this, mainly in the stomach where they have a high rate of gastric cancer. We've taken that and, and used it in the esophagus primarily. I think there are two main advantages of an EMR that number one, it gives a pathologist much more tissue to look at than the standard sort of pinch biopsies, which are usually one to two millimeters. We can give them one to two centimeter pieces of tissue. And, it's, and, it, and sometimes we can actually remove it and cure it. The pathologist can tell you whether your margins are clear. And as I'll show you, there is some data suggesting that for early cancer, the results are comparable to our standard esophagectomy. So here's a, a case here as an esophagus. There's a very subtle defect right here. And then when we remove it, we are left with a, a little defect here. And surprisingly, amazingly, patients really don't feel that. Uh, if you think about what causes sensation in the gastrointestinal tract, we were blessed, I guess, in that most of the sensation from the GI tract is from stretch or distension. So if I were to do a colonoscopy on a patient and just sit on the air button, at some point they'd wake up, turn around, 
grab the scope from me, hit me with the scope, and say, that's enough from you. But we can biopsy, we can resect, and they often don't feel it, which is a nice thing from our standpoint. The most common EMR technique used right now is what's called a band ligation EMR, and it's basically a combination of a hemorrhoid banding with a colonic polypectomy. So we find the lesion first, and then we inject uh, saline underneath the lesion what's into the submucosa to lift it away from the muscle layer here, which is the red. And the reason for doing that is you want to preserve that muscle layer. You don't want to put a hole in the muscle layer because then you have a perforation, which isn't good. And then we take a, an endoscope with this cap on that then sucks up into this cap, and we fire a rubber band around it. And so we've made it into a polyp. And now we can take a standard snare and just cut it off. And the complications and outcome of EMR in Barrett's esophagus are shown here. And there is a, lot, well, a wide variety or variation. Perforation is actually very rare. Bleeding is probably the most common complication. And that generally occurs right off the bat. And we can fix that, treat that with some injection or cautery. Stenosis it depends on how many resection specimens you do. The more you do, the more likely you are to get some scar tissue. But you can see the resection rate or cure rate can, is up to 95% in some studies uh, uh, in regards to early cancer. And then the, if patients do need to go on to surgery, um, they can do so. And there's very little uh, damage done to the esophagus to affect the surgical outcome. So now back to our patient. So here we are. We've got the cap on. We've got a, a needle, injecting needle here. This is going to come out and inject saline underneath the lesion to, again, lift it away from the muscle. You'll see that right here, a little bleb coming out. And that actually is an extremely good sign. It's, it's as sensitive as, as putting an ultrasound probe on there to seeing if, how, if this lesion is invasive or not. If you can lift it away from the muscle, it almost tells you 100% that it's not invasive. Next, we'll suck this lesion up into the cap and then put a rubber band around it. And so you have to just sort of position it. It's not, not that difficult. I've had some of my worst fellows be able to do this pretty well. And then you see there's a rubber band around it. And then we get a, a wire loop snare that's attached to some cautery. And then we close the snare ideally below the rubber band, as you'll see here. And again, the, this looks, we always show you the best one, right? I mean, that's the way it is. They generally go this well. I mean, there's a lot, sometimes a lot of motility um, that gets in the way, but for the most part, this is a relatively simple technique to do. And so we've cut through it there, and then we've removed the lesion, and here's our defect here. And that looks beautiful. There's no bleeding. Um, and what we hope to see is something like this. So we have a resection specimen here, usually one to two centimeters, and the pathologist will then look at higher, grade, higher power and see high-grade dysplasia, much like we saw on the confocal image. And ideally, he'll tell us that we got it all out and there's, their margins are free. Now, what, there are some patients that just have a very long segment of Barrett's esophagus and no focal nodule or lump or bump. Or they have a nodule or a lump or bump that we've taken out. And the question is, well, what do you do with the rest of the Barrett? You can't resect all that endoscopically. And we have these ablative technologies. And this is, basically takes advantage of the fact that every tissue in the body has a stem cell these cells that lie dormant until they're programmed to, to proliferate. And what they come back as is normal squamous lining of the esophagus in the case of the esophagus. And so we can burn the Barrett's off and in a non-acid environment so you control the reflux as well as you can. What comes back, ideally, is normal squamous. And here's a cartoon showing this. This is a patient with Barrett's esophagus here. We put these balloon probes down with, with an electrode on it that delivers radio frequency energy. And that basically burns the esophagus uh, very superficially, so it's not going down into the, the muscle at all. And then what comes back after ablation is, again, ideally, normal squamous. So here's a, a, a patient in question. We've got the balloon-based electrode in. And you can see the electrode actually fire here if you, you look closely enough. It's giving these little bursts of energy, usually two per cycle. We deflate the balloon. You can see this nice coagulum that's occurred. Uh, in the esophagus. And we do that the entire length of the esophagus. And, and generally, three to four sessions can get rid of the Barrett's in about 80 to 90 percent of the time, as, as this slide shows. So this is a, an endoscopic therapy for early esophageal cancer using a variety of sort of techniques. Uh, 
mucosal resection, or EMR, plus PDT. PDT was an earlier ablative technology called photodynamic therapy. We would inject the patient with this photo photosensitizing agent, which would go to every cell in the body, and then you'd go down and put a laser light on the esophagus and Barrett's, and it would burn it and uh, ablate it. The problem with PDT was that it was a very deep injury, a lot of strictures, as you can see, about 36% of patients in some studies. And they were phototoxic for, for six weeks, meaning they couldn't go out in the sun, which in Seattle is uh, not that difficult in the, summer, in the winter time. But in the summer, it would be real, a real challenge to tell a patient they couldn't go out in the sun for six weeks. As I said, the, the radiofrequency ablation, or RFA, has sort of replaced the PDT. And some of the more recent studies, again, suggest that you can get high grade, rid of high-grade dysplasia about 80% of the time with a relatively low uh, progression rate to cancer. So this really has become the way we manage now, I think, early cancer in Barrett's esophagus is what we refer to as multimodality therapy. So here's a, a case of a long segment of Barrett's. There's a, a squamous island here, but it's a long segment of Barrett's. Down near the gastroesophageal junction is a nodule. And again, when you have dysplasia on biopsy in the esophagus, and then there's a nodule, it's most likely that the nodule is going to be where the dysplasia is. And so you want to take that out, so you resect it, and you get your pathology to look at and confirm that you got it all out. But then you got to get rid of the, rid of the rest of the Barrett's. And the analogy I like to give the patients is that you've, you've pulled a weed from the garden. It's a little bit naive to think another weed's not going to grow back unless you get rid of that garden and replace it. And this is what the ablation does. So you, you burn the esophagus, and then with time, and generally just with about six to eight weeks, what comes back is normal squamous lining of the esophagus here. So to summarize, I think Barrett's is a, a pre-malignant condition the, that we see in most patients with esophageal cancer. And the incidence of Barrett's reflux and esophageal cancer is rising for uncertain reasons. But I think the advances in this endoscopic imaging, such as the confocal, is leading to better early detection of, of uh, neoplastic lesions. And that the advances in endoscopic therapy, the mucosal resection, the ablation, is leading to successful uh, non-surgical treatment of, of early cancer. And now what I'd like to do is introduce a couple people to help demonstrate some, uh, some of this technology. I have Habiba Habib, who's one of our gastrointestinal endoscopy nurses, who's been very kind to come and swallow the endoscope today. Oh, you didn't, I didn't tell you that? <laughs> Robert Diagazio is from Cell Visio, and they're going to come and demonstrate the the, the confocal, we, unfortunately, we don't, it's hard to get a live specimen without someone volunteering. No? So the probe, as you can see, is tiny. And again, it easily fits down the endoscopic accessory channel, which Robert's going to bring over. It's a blue light, la blue, uh, blue light laser. And you do have to be touching the mucosa. And so it's, this is not, I mean, it's a very focal pinpoint uh, imaging you're not going to be able to survey a whole field or a whole esophagus. You're going to be going after something that you suspect on, on your high-definition endoscopy to be the, the, the place of interest. All right, where's the fabric? So I'll put it on this. this uh, Robert was telling me that one of his colleagues had a shirt made with this and, and noticed that when he put the probe on the shirt, it, it fluoresced and gave a good example. And so he cut up his shirt and distributed it to... <laughs> And I was uh, commenting, well, it probably was a really ugly shirt at one point. <laughs> so you can see the, it's a little bit hard with the lights, but you can see the nice, uh, the nice uh, individual fibers of the, of the shirt fabric. So again, this is down to 20 microns that we're imaging. And what it's forced gastroenterologists to do something that I wasn't planning on doing at some point, was actually become a, a real-time pathologist again. I mean, we all are taught pathology as we go through school, and then you pick up an endoscope, and you don't think of it really uh, any much anymore. But we've, we, uh, we have to uh, go back and, and be real-time pathologists, which has actually been somewhat of the hallmark of this GI division here. We, uh, we've always had gastroenterologists that, in fact, Cy Rubin was was the first to really introduce gastrointestinal biopsies and describing diseases by, based on histology. And so I think it's, a, it's this nice 360 that's come about. I think my, my father would say that the endoscope is, is, is an invaluable tool, but 
often he, I think he felt that we were losing sort of our, the cerebral uh, thinking man part of it. And, and I think this is bringing us back to that, which is good. So anyway, any questions or people want to come up and play with it? It's only $10,000, so that's... Uh, <laughs> actually, these probes are, you get 20 uses out of them, and then they, they magically just break. Right, Robert? <laughs> oh, good. I bet you're going to charge me for that. But, um, and they cost about, what, $4,000 per probe? Is that right? Uh, a, little more. a little bit more than that. Um, questions at the mic if people uh, have any. I can't see if anybody's. Um, I have a couple questions. The first one is, what other parts of the body would you use radio frequency ablation in? So the question is, where else to use RFA or radio frequency ablation? And, and people are, are interested in um, looking at it in the bladder with uh, urologic tumors. Any place you could imagine there'd be a superficial cancer that you'd like to, to uh, eradicate without surgery. Um, they're actually looking at it in certain cardiopulmonary diseases as well. Um, so lungs with lung cancer. Um, not just radio frequency ablation, but cryotherapy is being looked at in, in, in any place where you can imagine there'd be an early superficial tumor mm -hmm. that you could focally de deliver uh, injury to, as opposed to the, the radiation that we get for patients, which is more of a global injury. Um, the, these, these targeted ablations uh, try to do that without having the side effect of, uh, or the, the innocent bystanders, if you will, being, being hit. Uh, the techniques that you're using here at the U, are they being used by other gastroenterologists in town too, like the confocal and the um, EMR? The, um, as far as the techniques uh, that we use here, are they being used elsewhere? I, th I don't think anybody else in the city is using confocal microscopy. Is that right, Robert? Um, it's a relatively newer technique, and I still think it's a, a clinical research technique. I, I think we, we're using this on a research basis, but uh, you know, with patients, obviously. Um, as far as the ablation and resection, yeah, that's almost becoming standard in, in, uh, in, in gastroenterology. At least I, I think it actually should be. In fact, I think all our fellows should be able to do an endoscopic mucosal resection. Because I think gone are the days where you have a diagnostic endoscopy. I mean, we really shouldn't be doing diagnostic endoscopies. We should be doing therapeutic endoscopies. We have far better, I mean, we have such good non-invasive imaging now. And colonoscopy is a great example. You know, we do colon cancer screening with colonoscopy primarily. But I think that at some point needs to be replaced by a non-invasive screening tool. Um, and those that have positive findings then would go on to colonoscopy. So it should primarily be for therapeutic reasons. We're far too busy to do screening normal studies. I mean. Uh, I think I, I like to tell a patient everything's normal, but for the most part, I think we, we, we need tools that can give us um, the answer non-invasively. So I think every fellow should be trained by to do an EMR. All, all my fellows agree to do that. Some of them, you have to have a, a little bit of a tight sphincter to do that um, in some cases. Um, I mean, the, the complications happen when you do procedures, and you just need to be able to accept that and take responsibility for them and fix them when they happen. That's when we call Dr. Foy, our surgeon. <laughs> come, come bail me out. Yes. Well, actually, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned uh, non-invasive alternatives to colonoscopy, and what would you suggest? And the other thing <laughs> is, um, I'm a bit confused. I wasn't going to ask a question tonight, but since nobody else is asking, I will. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, when people go in for a physical exam, normally they are not screened for Barrett's esophagus. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering at what point you decide to go in and screen for uh, Barrett's esophagus or other GI problems. Is it just when there are symptoms? Um, do you ever do it in, a, in just a routine exam? Uh, can you enlighten us a little more? If we're going into the doc for a routine exam, should the doc be, be checking something? Sure. Uh, so the first part of the question was um, what to do for non-invasive colon cancer screening. And I may have jumped ahead of ourselves or myself because colonoscopy is still generally recommended, although there are alternatives coming. Uh, 
One has been the CT colonography or the virtual colonoscopy. This is a, a non-contrast CT scan of the abdomen with some, some computer reconstruction looking at the colon. And some of the early data suggested it, it can be a viable, potentially be a viable alternative. It's not mainstream yet because the, its cost is too high. Most insurance companies won't pay for it. Um, and the, the data outside of selective centers hasn't been as good as we had hoped. But I think something like that will come. So for now, though, you should do your colonoscopy. And your other question as far as what to, what to get as far as screening goes for some of these conditions. And I'll be specific about Barrett's first because we, we talked about that tonight. In general, the, the screening for Barrett's should really be those people with risk factors. And as if you may remember, it was the age, chronic reflux, white male, predominantly. Um, that's not an exclusive club, but that's generally a pretty good bet. And so if you have chronic reflux symptoms, generally over five years or so, or need medications to treat reflux, that would be an indication to get an endoscopy. And that's not something you're going to get at your primary care provider. They're going to make a referral for you to see a gastroenterologist generally to get that done. We do like to do, I mean, screening by definition is on patients with no symptoms, whether it's the colon or whether it's for Barrett's patient for chronic reflux. What we do know about gastrointestinal tract cancers is, or any cancer for that matter, but primarily a GI tract, is if you wait till symptoms, generally those tumors are too far advanced at the time of detect detection. So we screen asymptomatic or no patients without symptoms. But colon, again, look, if you looked at the pyramid of things as far as your, your risk, it's colon, lung, breast, and then esophageal is far down the list still. And that's why many countries, such as Europe and, and uh, Canada, don't screen for esophageal cancer. We do here in this country if they have those specific risk factors I mentioned. Yes, another question. Yeah, uh, I'm curious, uh, with technology, the way it is advancing, um, it seems like more treatments are um, potentially going to be done on the table. Um, w you demonstrated, you sh showed a video where you're looking at something very small and you commented that it was very difficult to, to keep still. And I'm curious what technologies are, are coming about that are going to aid um, doctors like yourself in those precise treatments uh, on those microscopic levels? That's a good question. What technologies are going to aid us with these, you know, you know, one development or one advance highlights where you're glaringly deficient in others. And, and you know, it's, it's bright people thinking of solutions, I guess, is my answer. Um, and, and sometimes it's a simple one. For, the, for, in, for instance, in the case of confocal, when you put it through the regular endoscope at the end, there is a lot of movement. And so we circumvent that by putting just a plastic cap on the end. And the plastic cap helps stabilize the, the mucosa so that you can put the probe right onto it. So sometimes this is a very simple five cent uh, solution. I wish it was always like that, but I guess that's, that's as, as good as I can answer. Um, I think it's, you know, one, one advance leads to, that's the thing about research is one step forward, two steps back is generally the, the dictum. I was just curious, when, when you were talking about um, the people who had GERD and then 20 years later, even though they had the um, columnar situation versus squamous tissue in the esophagus, the Barrett's yeah. esophagus, and they were saying they had no more problems, they weren't having a trouble with GERD. Has it been determined that when they go into the Barrett's esophagus that it's, it's definitely a bad thing versus maybe some of these people it, it's becoming an adaptive evolutionary thing? Well, that's exactly right. So the question was, is, is Barrett's a, a, a good thing in some patients? And I know Brian Reed, who is head of the Seattle Barrett's Project at the Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Research Center, strongly believes that, that he thinks Barrett's is adaptive and a good thing for many patients. It just, in a small subset, goes on to cancer. And so do we, and so do we know how to determine which ones were in Well, a how we, do have, we determine which ones it's good and how it's bad? We take biopsies looking for dysplasia. There's other adjunctive uh, risk stratification tools like flow cytometry, which measures the, the number of chromosomes in the cells, and, and abnormal chromosomes has been associated with progression. But generally, we, we take biopsies now. And that maybe at some point, we'll have non-invasive markers, but, but we're not there yet. 
Great, and, and one, just one last one for, for my own simplistic understanding. Sure. When you were talking about the hiatal hernia and the sliding, you know, what's the difference between that and an epigastric hernia? So the difference between a sliding hiatal hernia and an epigastric hernia. Well, epigastrium is just the location, remember? That's in the upper part of the stomach, below the sternum. And so a uh, hiatal hernia, by definition, is, is an epigastric hernia. There's different types of hiatal hernias, a sliding, what's called a paraesophageal hernia, and it's all in relation to where the gastroesophageal junction is, the diaphragm hole, and the stomach. And, um, but by far and away, the most common are sliding hiatal hernias. I was just kind of curious uh, about the barrier esophagus. How exactly does the stratified squamous turn into the simple columnar? I mean, these flat cells turn into these kind of tall, yeah. low surface area cells. So how does squamous go into Barrett's? How does this metaplasia occur? And that is the golden question. Um, you know, we think a chronic acid injury leads to a change in the progenitor stem cell that then programs the cells to no longer be squamous but now be columnar. And again, if you could answer that question, that'd be good. <laughs>